So first of all, before I introduce myself, I'll tell you uh, we're honored to have uh, Open Daylight Royalty in the house. Uh, Ed and Warnicke is, uh, in many ways, the father of Open Daylight. We quote him in the slides, so um, he'll keep me honest. Ed knows every line of code, every project, every committer. He's a committer on every project. So anyway, Ed is in the house, and if we go deep and we want to talk Java, we'll talk to Ed, and if you just want to harass him, we'll talk to Ed. And if you have things to throw, throw them at Ed. So, I'll introduce you myself. My name is Paul Quinn. I'm the father of service chaining, not of ODL. So that's the, the distinction, um, although I do a lot of work in open daylight today. I am a Cisco Distinguished Engineer, and I spend the bulk of my time, oops, let me, the bulk of my time working on service chaining. I tend to be a little data center centric. However, service chaining has emerged as much broader than data center, so I've uh, had to learn a lot the last few years. And lately, we've been doing a, service chaining is the perfect, I'm trying to think of the right word, perfect vehicle or perfect um, architecture for a controller. Um, the very nature of service chaining, knowing where services are, linking them together and so on, begs for a controller. And luckily, Ed had the answer to the question and that answer was open daylight. So, I'll start, should have put my email address. If anyone wants to email me questions, my email address is paulq at cisco.com. So we'll talk a little bit about Open Daylight. How many of you are familiar with Open Daylight? More than just that it, yeah, okay. Good, so we'll, we'll give you a little intro to Open Daylight. If it's too basic, we'll move through it. If it's not basic enough, we'll slow down. I'll talk to you about service function chaining. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay. And then we'll talk a little bit about the implementation, kind of the building blocks implementation, some of the architecture, and then I can show you the API browsing. Unfortunately, my actual uh, service chaining didn't work for some reason. But we do have it running just over there, and you can walk over and see it in action uh, with Cisco product and with open source project, and integrating with other open daylight projects through the internal APIs. So we have a full suite running there. So that's impressive. We're going to do it the old way. Is it going to work now? No? All right. So. I'm just going through by hand, since that didn't work. Maybe it's because I went out of sight. So what is Open Daylight? First and foremost, most of you know, I'll make sure we're all on the same page. It is a multi-project platform for building uh, what we would call today, in using the industry buzzwords, a controller. Fundamentally, it is a, a platform, and I think that's key. It is not an SDK, it's a platform that people used to author applications on. It provides a subset or a, uh, an infrastructure set of features that can be leveraged by upper layer applications. And it presents access to those, and we'll talk about it, through a series of northbound APIs. It is open source, and I can't stress that enough. If you haven't, you can pull it right now while we're sitting here. You can pull the full controller build. You can pull every one of the projects that I'm gonna show you on a list in a moment and build them yourself. It's a, a Java project and um, with a very vibrant community working on it. There we go. So ODL has member companies who participate. This is just a list. The details probably don't matter. But the point is most major vendors participate in Open Daylight. Having said that, anyone is free to be a committer and anyone can commit code. We have people who work on service chaining, the project I'm most familiar with, who are not necessarily corporate uh, sponsored developers. There are people who are interested in the project and work on it. And by the way, if you're a good Java developer, I would urge you to come work on service chaining. Don't work on the others, work on service chaining. Um, if you're a good network overlay person, we're gonna be spinning up a big Lisp project. Talk to Ed and get involved. I, and I really mean that. This is a, uh, I, I, one of the things I'd like to stress today is that we should all participate. Um, Open Daylight has matured significantly. If you've played with early versions, uh, the latest version of Lithium is very feature rich. Again, speaking from service chaining, we've added a whole slew of features from sophisticated selection algorithms to load balancing um, that are actually probably not available in a commercial product today that's available in ODL. And by the way, committed by non-Cisco committers. Real community at work. So again, an overview, these are a list of the current Lithium projects. It gives you the sense of the scope of Open Daylight. So you have protocol plugins for speaking southbound to devices. Basically, 
If there's a protocol you want to use to speak to a node, it's, I'm, it's, it's probably there. By the way, I'm going to keep moving a bit. I, uh, I tightened my back. I wish I could tell I was doing something very manly, like changing a tire or fighting a lion. But I put back a very small weight, maybe seven and a half pounds at the gym, at the hotel. And I've been walking oddly since. So but just, just so you know why I'm moving around. It's not because I'm nervous. It's because if I stand still, it tightens up. Uh, my red eye six hour flight tonight is going to be a joy. Um, so if you have a southbound protocol in mind, we probably have it. If you have a device that you want to speak with another protocol, there's a very clean architecture for registering a southbound plugin. We're going to talk about that in a little bit and having it communicate southbound through well, de developing a renderer and then having the protocol communicate southbound. From an application perspective, there's a slew of them. Today, obviously, we're going to be talking about, and the laser doesn't work, service chaining, S oop, SFC. Um, no one's asked me why we call it SFC and not SC. Um, one of the things we've done with service chaining, and I'll mention it again, but is we, we've tried to standardize a lot of the protocol work in the ITF. And the reason we've tried to do that is, by its very nature, linking together services is a multi-vendor process. Right? No one has a uni-vendor service chain. So by trying to standardize it, we had to go to the ITF. And, and by the way, we, we, it's well on its way. Um, but the nomenclature that the working group decided on was service function chaining to differentiate from a higher level service that an SP might offer. Just a bit of historical. So I say service chaining, I really mean service function chaining. A service function is the actual service. So I think the core tenets are, are very interesting. Most of them are from Ed. I'll give you an Ed one here, which is, uh, I, I only do it to embarrass him because he's in the room, but one of Ed's core tenets is, is code is the coin of the realm. And we very much believe that. If your code is good, we will take it. We don't care who you work for. We don't care if you don't work, as long as your code is good. And we try very hard in the open daily community to be a meritocracy. Write good code, get progress. And, and we operate that way as a Cisco a project with a lot of Cisco people or not. And service function chaining uh, very much is that. So it's a platform. So you d develop and load applications on open daylight. You might write infrastructure in open daylight, like surface chaining. You might write an upper layer application that uses service chaining. You might write an application within ODL that uses another one. For example, there's a project called, and we're not going to delve into it today because we have 30 minutes. There's a project called group-based policy. Anyone familiar with the ACI-like model of group-based policy? So we have an open source implementation of group-based policy. Again, you can pull it right now. And that adds the ability to use a service chain as part of the contract. So there's another project using another project and truly showing the value of the platform. And if anyone wants to see that, by the way, we are, we are demoing that project. Um, as I said, a very innovative community and a vibrant community. The mailing lists are crazy. I can't keep up with them. Um, lots of people working. Because the strength of an open source project is very much its community. If there's two guys coding in their basement, it's probably not a big community. We have a lot of developers, a lot of people um, working. It's model driven. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But all the definitions that create the APIs, all of the, the spec, the, all of the infrastructure is generated from Yang data models. And what that allows us to do is have extensions in Yang and have those exposed through the APIs. And we'll talk a little bit about Yang tools. And as I said, a common northbound API, everybody speaks to the same northbound API, all the applications. So for example, in the booth, we're showing a GUI. And this GUI drives service chaining. That GUI is no different than if you wrote a GUI, the same APIs, or if you used a Python project, all of them speak to the same APIs. Having said that, the southbound is device specific and we route messages to the appropriate southbound plugin. So in the booth, we are showing the provisioning of a Cisco router. We are showing the provisioning of an OVS virtual switch. They use different southbound protocols for, for provisioning, of course. And both of that, route, that routing and that provisioning happens seamlessly. The upper layer never says, please configure an OVS switch. It simply says, configure the switch for service chaining. And the internal routing, and we'll talk about that through the provider, provides that functionality. It's a very, very powerful view of the network. And I would argue one of the core benefits, or you know, SDN benefits, is that abstract it's true abstraction. You don't say, 
hey man, what, what can I program today on this device? That's not there. Which is what we do today, right? I mean, you SSH to box A, maybe you do SNMP to box B, maybe you have a GUI, you know, et cetera. So open daylight, high level architecture is a series of components, as I said, I wish the laser worked. Um, but there is a set of, it's a misnomer, of core services, service chaining is one of them. You could have uh, PCP, you could have, uh, well, you, know, you see it, forwarding rules, statistics, the L2 overlay, all that is contained there. There's some core infrastructure that everyone uses. For example, we'll talk about the data store. We all write into a common data store. We have our trees in the data store. And that way, any application can access information. The southbound listeners use that data store to know what to write. And then, of course, as I said, the southbound protocols that speak to the devices. It's a very simple view, but it's actually an incredibly accurate view. For those of you who haven't done development in open daylight, just to note, there's a project called Toaster that lets you build a toaster in open daylight. And by toaster, I mean bread toaster. It's not some cool network device. Um, it's a great walkthrough of how to use this infrastructure. It's on the open daylight development wiki. I would say start there. Um, it's a good, good way to get used to these pieces and how to use things in between them. I would also urge you, well, we'll talk about it, but to, to, to spin up an open daylight, and I'll show you how to browse the APIs. Uh, I forget who did the project, but there's a, an API browser, which is fantastic. I use it every day when I'm working with Open Daylight. I'll, I'll show it to you live in a minute. Unless this gentleman wrote it, because he's grinning. I don't know. <laughs> if so, I apologize. Yeah. So how many of you are familiar with Yang? OK, so it's a modeling language. It's a standardized modeling language. Um, it's an RFC, 6020. It's, it's been around for a long time, very long time. Um, only recently kind of gotten cool. But it's very cool all of a sudden. And it provides us the ability to have a common language for defining what we're trying to do in open daylight. More or equally importantly, it can be augmented. So, and that's the type of innovation we're talking about. I don't have to ask permission to make changes. So let's say you have a service chaining application, you present some form of service chain, and I want to add to it. I don't have to come to you and ask your permission. And that, that changes things, right? If I have to be, have a gatekeeper to a project, it's not so, so much a meritocracy anymore, right? It comes maybe a little club. Clubs are tough. Hey, clubs are cool if you're in the club, and not so cool. You know, it's the old joke, I, any club that'll have me. Um, but with Yang, we can augment a model. So you can take the service chaining model. You can say, I'm going to do another version. I'm going to augment those models with the extra characteristics I need and extend the APIs. You'll still get the service chaining APIs plus your extensions. And that's what we get here. And the way we get that is there's something called Yang tools. And Yang tools, essentially, the term that, that uh, Ed uses is provides codecs. Yang tools automatically generates Java from the Yang data models. And until you've tried it, it words don't describe how cool it is. Me saying that, you go, yeah, that's cool. You try it, you go, wow, that's cool. Uh, Ed has, Ed, what was your session number? Do you know it? 2761. If you go look at Ed's slides from 2761, he actually has, we have 30 minutes, we're not going to do it. He actually has slides that show you the Yang and the converted from Yang tools Java. Mind blowing, really. It's auto generated code from Yang to provide APIs. For the SFC APIs, all of it came from data model. We never went and wrote the API per se. Now, of course, you have to have the provider that does stuff, but all the code is auto generated to create the APIs. So things like the netconf, the restconfs, all those bindings, all that happens automatically from Yang tools. It is the foundation to this dance. OK, so I'm going to pause for a moment. Any, back up, any, I'm trying to be aware of time, because I know Mike Rao, Rao uh, has a, a slides coming up, a dirty job to do. Um, comments, thoughts? OK, I'm going to jump. Um, by the way, I'm also not leaving after this to go to the keynote. So if anyone needs to talk, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, and I'll be here after the keynote. Evolving service deployment. So let's talk for a moment, and I will try to be brief. Uh, this is a topic I can talk about for a couple days without any hesitation. Uh, and Ed knows this. So let's just very quickly. Service functions, firewalls, load balancers, DPI, IPS, whatever you like. HTTP header enrichment, that's the new cool one. Add insertion. 
um, video optimizers, et cetera, are all everywhere. Everyone has them. There's very few networks without some form of service in it. But the way you deploy them today doesn't really match the modern SDN vision. Right? You go there and you create a VLAN in and you create a VLAN out and you do PBR. You touch the network. But the whole premise here is that you're abstracting and getting away from this hop by hop view of the world. Um, in general, it's a major problem when trying to roll out applications. When I talk to customers, particularly enterprise customers, we'll talk about the service separately, but particularly enterprise, say, look, my, my business app guy has an app. It takes me months to get the network ready because I have to find a way to get the firewall, I have to make change requests, and et cetera. What we try to say with service chaining is we change that. We embrace this model of programmatic access to network, but we don't just hide the network by doing it. We're not just making it a better way to configure VLANs. That would be a disaster. We've all tried that too, by the way. It doesn't work. Um, what we say here is that the, the, the best way to say it, I think, and I, I use this a lot, is the services are no longer bumps in the wire, which they are today. Rather, they're resources with characteristics available for consumption. Think of it more like, uh, I, I hesitate to say this, think of it more like service pathing or routing, but I don't mean in a routing sense, than bump in the wire. So I have this resource, it just happens to be a firewall. I have another resource that happens to be an IPS, and now I know that a certain class of traffic, all traffic or some traffic, needs to consume those resources. That's what service chaining does. It very much embraces the concept of abstraction. We have these abstract services, and then we use them in the network. So, just like we had ODL core principles, we have service chaining core principles. Topology independent. Again, you're not changing VLANs. Transport independent. You like VXLAN, you like GRE, I like MPLS. Can't we all just get along? Absolutely. I actually, uh, I've had a customer, the customer said it publicly, it's not, I'm not leaking privileged information. Rackspace has stood up at IETF and said, I have four different overlays across different clouds, different customer environments. I want to chain across them. I don't want to take VXLAN and have this weird mapping function to copy some bits out of the VXLAN header into my MPLS label stack. I can't do this. I mean, I can, but I can do it once. I can't do it a thousand or 10,000 or a million times. I want to offer a clean interface to provisioning and orchestration. In other words, I want ODL, from a, a provisioning perspective, when it reaches down, to have a simple thing to do, not trying to program a million flows at a time. I want to provide clear visibility in OAM. That's huge. It's something that those of us who are protocol people, like myself, never think about. I'll be honest with you. It's always, you guys, it's, you guys have networks. You know, how many times do you say, look, man, I just need to know what's going on. So fundamentally, we say, in a service chain, you should be able, one, to visualize, and two, to packet analyze. You put a sniffer, I can tell you explicitly where you are in that service chain by just looking at a header. I don't have to go trace which VLAN stopped at which switch and which port, forget that. Audit, reporting, again, it's, it's kind of moving into the modern world. I want to unburden the service functions. What I mean by that is I don't want my firewall having to be a router. Right? Um, for those of you who build service functions, it's a lot easier. I don't care which control plane you use. I like a centralized, but if you said, look, man, I'm obsessed with doing this with IS to IS, we can make it happen. And last and most importantly, I want to support metadata. And by metadata, I mean the ability to pass information to the elements in the service chain. I might want to say at ingress, this is Bob. I might want to go to a DPI and have DPI say, this is Bob's Skype traffic. I might want to go to a firewall and have the firewall deny Bob Skype traffic. Metadata, because today our policy, policy authorship is based on legacy constructs. You're on a red VLAN, you're bad. You're on a green VLAN, you're good. What does that mean? And more importantly, when you build a cloud data center, do you really want to track red and green VLANs? You can't. Do you want to track IP addresses? Absolutely not. You want metadata. And just so you know, we see this tremendous uptick in this, uh, particularly in the mobile space and all these, where the mobile guys know that your phone is an Android versus iPhone, a business versus residential. All this information is used for policy. In the old days, like yesterday, or uh, six months ago, they would create a VLAN for each of those, which is fine, as long as you never have to touch it. So, I, I'm gonna gloss over this in the interest of time. I wanna get back to the ODL. 
There are several elements in the service chain. Fundamentally, the thing that tells you which traffic goes in the chain, and there's elements that forward along the chain. Um, I'm happy to delve into it. I just want to talk a little bit open daylight like, to, to do justice to the topic. That's the high level picture. Essentially, this is the ODL component, and ODL interfaces with a classifier, optionally, and the nodes that perform the forwarding along the service chain. The nodes that perform the forwarding are the only ones that have to understand the service chain. Intermediate nodes do not. It's, it's very, very important. In other words, if I'm service chain with Greg, and we have 10 routers between us, the 10 routers just see an IP packet. Greg, on the other hand, participates in the service chain and knows something about what's going on. So let's talk about, oh, color's weird. Let's talk about the, the main components of uh, open daylight. Essentially, there's a, there's a provider, which is, you can think of it as the main program. The provider is the, the point for wi from which all things derive in open daylight's SFC implementation. It, it's fundamentally a point to multi-point architecture, and I'll show you the multi-points in a moment. The Yang models, uh, I'll show you in a moment some of them. We have published the service chaining Yang models in the IETF. They're, they're, well, one, they're in the code, and you can pull the code right now, but they've also been published as an, uh, uh, the draft, not an RFC. There's the UI, which I'll, I'll show you a quick glance, and you can come play with, by the way, if you want to go play with the UI. We have it over there. The data plane, I'm going to gloss over, because that's a discussion unto itself, but fundamentally, ODL reaches down and programs forwarders, as I discussed, with something called network service header, which is an, a proposed IETF protocol that has quite broad vendor support. And then the listeners and the renders are the points in the multipoint, and <coughs> excuse me, depending on the protocol, they do different things southbound. All this is documented. None of this is secret. It's all documented on the Open Daylight Wiki. So. Let's just say there are several Yang models used to generate the various APIs. Some of them, by the way, you don't ever, as a, if you're a user, you might never touch. You might, the simplest case is service function chain. No, it's not there. Oh, yeah, right here. This one, the service function chain model, is the simplest one. And what it does is provides an API where you, as a user, ask for a service chain. That's it. Now, a service chain is asked for by type of service. And we've done that on purpose because we feel that in many cases, the user doesn't care if it's firewall one or firewall two. He wants a firewall. Give me a firewall. And Open Daylight will pick firewall one versus firewall two. Open Daylight will load balance them. Open Daylight will round robin and do all those things. But as a user, you express the chain as a series of types. You're not limited to that. That's the default model. We've also presented, through the Yang model, a service function path right here, which provides an alternate API where you can say, give me firewall 62 and load balancer 12. You'd have to have reasons to do that, I think. You might have them, by the way. They're, they're valid reasons, but. So as I said, it's a, I'm sorry, the font is gray. Um, it's when I applied the template they gave me for Cisco Live. It's, it's my fault, but I, I didn't notice. Open Daylight is a, a point to multi-point, as I said. And let me just get to the picture and make more sense. There you go. So the provider is the main function, and it listens for all events that come in from outside. So the GUI, um, whether it's a registration, whether it's from the GUI from REST and so on, the provider listens to those. It writes into its data store. We have a service function tree in the data store. And the listeners listen for events in the data store based on, an, in this implementation, based on a Yang augmentation. So we have an augmentation that says, if you're an OVS listener, op OpenFlow listener, listen for SFC OpenFlow events. The provider writes to the data store, and the listener, when it sees that an OpenFlow switch needs to be programmed, it picks up that message, pulls the data from the data store. It actually interacts with its own data store. I don't show it here, but it actually inter up, interacts with its own data store. For example, to do OVS DB CRUD, it writes to its own data store to keep track of the CRUD it's operating. Same model over and over. It's a pattern. The pattern is repeated. This is the fundamental view of the infrastructure we wrote. It, it's actually quite complex um, in code. There's a lot of code. But the, the architecture is simple and can be replicated. So if you wanted to write another listener, you would register that listener. You would register with the data store. You would listen for changes. You would act on it. 
the listeners then take the data sent to it from SFC or data, pick that out of the data store, and they have a renderer. And the renderer essentially takes the abstract service function chaining and renders it into the appropriate language to push down. So in the open flow case, it takes the SFC JSON and renders it into open flow flow mods that it pushes to the switch. Each one of them has its own rendering implementation. And that is the gist of the SFC application. Point to multipoint, common data store, and common infrastructure shared among everyone. You write your own listener, you augment with Yang, and you register. So as I said, there is a UI. Um, we use it for demo. It makes for a quick way to get your hands dirty. I would recommend you try it. As I said, we're running it over here. If you want to come click around, you feel free. I mean, there's no uh, problem. It, it is very easy to use. It lets you create service chains, create service paths, view them. Uh, we have a little drag and drop. It, you know, it's cool. It's great for demos. Um, but it uses the same APIs. Uh, I'll show you here. It's fine. The last thing I'm going to show, uh, I have an example of the JSON. Do we give out these slides, Jim? Yeah, OK. I'll, you'll get a copy. The JSON essentially is what's moved around through the APIs, and it defines the service chain. So for example, here we've defined a service function. This is how a service function we register. And it basically presents itself, its name, where it is in the network, and what type of transports it supports. I do want to show you one more thing. We have two minutes left. Oh, by the way, here is what a service chain looks like written to the data store in operational data. We pulled it out through the REST API again. It's always the same, REST API. So you'll see that we have a service function path. So this is the actual instance. We're doing it. We have, it's associated with a chain because the chain was kind of the, the abstract. Here we've chosen it. We've chosen, um, here's the, the hop. We've chosen it, service function four. It's hanging off switch three. And these indices are network service header data that's being pushed to the open flow switches. So lastly, I'm going to end with the coolest part because that's the smart way to end a presentation. Um, not by looking at me, but by looking at the API browser. So this is the API browser. This is the URL. If you stand up a controller, that is the, the URL you go to. It's documented online. It's not a, a secret. And so for example, I can look at service function chain, the one we've been talking about. I can get it. I can put it. I can. So if I do put, it shows me what the model is, the parameters, what it expects. And I can actually, I, I don't have the JSON in front of me, but I could actually um, execute the command, the, the REST command to the server, get the JSON back, or post the JSON as I see fit. This is true for all projects in open daylight that are all the modern projects in open daylight. I think we deprecated the others. Uh, I use this all the time. And if you want to kind of learn, you want, if you pull the code and you look at the Yang, you look at this, then you go look at the Java, you kind of see the continuation through the whole project. And on that note, I am on time. So I'll pause for a moment. Thank you. And let me know if anyone questions, thoughts. Um, I'm not running away. I know you guys are probably going to go to the keynote, but I'll stick around and so will Ed. And uh, I like to vote. See, I should tell you that Ed makes me do things all the time. He calls me and says, look, we got to get this code done. We got to do this. So now I get to reciprocate. So it's what goes around comes around. I believe the term is karma. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone had fun. Um, Cisco Live, I hope. And if you have questions, please do email me. Uh, in case you can't tell, I do love to talk about this. Um, PaulQ at Cisco.com. Anytime, no prompts. I mean it. And if you go to ITF, um, we can commiserate there about the ITF. That's a different conversation entirely. <laughs> Thanks, guys.